From the guy who brought you Batman and the Green Goblin in a lighthouse comes The Northman, a movie filled with so much throat singing I thought I was at a Mongolian metal concert. Uh. This epic two-hour tale based off Scandinavian legend would actually become the basis for Shakespeare's Hamlet, both tales containing revenge, murder, and the supernatural. So in this video we'll be taking a deep dive into the Northmen, its ending, and some of the details you may have missed along the way. And be sure to like and subscribe, the gods demand it. The first shot is of a real Icelandic volcano, Mount Hekla, literally translated it means gates of hell. And as we'll see throughout the film it becomes more and more more active, paralleling our main character's journey of revenge. And the movie's narration flat out tells us what will happen, that a prince destined for Valhalla will seek revenge. This transitions us to shots of ravens in a snowstorm, an apt image considering Amleth's father, King Orvendil, is also known as the War Raven. The ominous weather foreshadows the king's eventual death, and ravens become a sort of guide for Amleth along his journey. Ravens are also what the Norse god Odin used to bring him information, so every time they're on screen you could say that Odin is watching. Eagerly anticipating his father's arrival is young Amleth, who lives this sort of fairy tale life with his noble father, adoring mother, and loyal kingdom. When the king arrives, you get the sense that he's a loved and respected king. The people kneel before him and offer him gifts, but there's someone who doesn't join the king on his victorious ride from battle into town. His brother Fjolnir. At the welcome celebration, the king gives Amleth a necklace taken off the dead body of a rival prince's neck. He will wear this into adulthood as a reminder of his father. It's kind of ironic it's taken off a dead prince as Amleth will also become a dead prince, but we'll get into that in a bit. The first inkling that this fairy tale life isn't what it seems occurs when Hymir the Fool makes an off-color joke about Queen Gudrun getting men hard. Now the king doesn't really care Care. That's what the fool is supposed to do, but it's Fjolnir who defends the queen's honor. When we get to one of the big reveals later in the film, this scene will make a lot more sense. The king is dying, having sustained a wound to the liver that is slowly killing him, so he takes his son to undergo a mystical ritual to prepare him for adulthood. There he inhabits the qualities of a wolf, something primal and raw that will become part of his persona throughout the film. It's here Amleth must pledge to save safeguard his family, and should his father die in battle, avenge him. Amleth cries and his tear is collected by the fool, saying it will be the last tear he sheds until he needs it. This tear will later be given back to him as an adult by the Cirrus. It's also here that we get our first look of Yggdrasil, the cosmic tree that serves as the connection between the nine worlds in Norse mythology. In the Northmen it also serves as a literal family tree showing the rightful rulers of Amleth's bloodline. But Amleth's reunion with his father is short-lived because as they emerge from their ritual, his father is shot by arrows. The assailant, his brother Fjolnir. It's a brutal coup that sees Amleth fight for his life, cutting off the nose of one of his attackers who will eventually tell the new king that young Amleth was killed. From this point on, Amleth vows to save his mother, avenge his father, and retake his kingdom. Fast forward several years and Amleth's vow, well, it's gone by the wayside. He's turned into an emotionless, animalistic berserker who carries out bloody raids to amass slaves for warring kingdoms. He seemed to have forgotten what fate has in store for him. However, that's all to change when Asiris, of course played by Bjork, returns to him the last tear he shed, reminding him of his vow and that the gods have a fate plan for him. The Cirrus tells him that he will get his revenge atop a mountain filled with fire and that a maiden king will spring from his ashes. It's all pretty cryptic and Amleth doesn't really know where to go until he hears that Fjolnir lost much of his kingdom and fled to Iceland. And where are those slaves they just got headed? Iceland of course. So he cuts his hair and brands his chest disguising himself as a slave to get closer to his murderous uncle. It's here he meets Olga of the Birch Forest who will become Amleth ally and lover. Together they join forces to take down Fjolnir, however when Amleth's able to gain access to the king's quarters, he makes a shocking discovery, that his mother is now married to his uncle. Amleth sneaks off into the night where ravens guide him to a he-witch. This dude holds the 
rotting head of the fool who was beheaded by Fjolnir, probably for that sexual comment he made about the queen. There he learns where he must find the weapon the gods want him to exact his revenge with, and in order to acquire it, he must kill the Mound Dweller, an undead sword wielder who seems to be derived from the Old Norse Draugrs, the dead who watch over tombs. The Draugr is thought to be an early type of vampire, which may explain its vulnerability to moonlight and how it holds a sword that can only be unsheathed at night or at the gates of hell. Regardless, Amleth fells the creature, but knows he can't kill Fjolnir just yet. Fate has told him that he will kill his uncle among a lake of fire, and there's none of that in the village. So Amleth bides his time, doing whatever he can to make life for the king and his men a living hell. This includes a brutal scene in which Amleth chops up a bunch of the king's men and nails them to a longhouse, an act which the king surmises may be the work of Christians since their god was nailed in a similar fashion. Amleth gains special privileges when he saves the king's son during a game of Nataliker. Basically, an old Viking game using paddles that looks a bit similar to lacrosse. Bonus points if you caught that the huge opponent on the other team was played by the Mountain from Game of Thrones, who also happens to be Icelandic. Amleth and Olga devise a plan to poison the guards, allowing Amleth to rescue his mother. But he finds out that his mother never loved his father. Not only that, he finds out that he wasn't the son of a loving marriage like he always thought, but that his father took his mother as a slave bride and forced himself upon her. He is not the child of of love, but of rape. All this time, it was the queen who begged Fjolnir to kill his own brother and take over the throne so the two of them could be together. Now that event where the fool made fun of the queen and the king not protecting her honor while Fjolnir did makes a little more sense. But Amleth tells her he saw her screaming that day his father was killed, but she says those were laughs. Is this to be believed or are we merely hearing the words of a madwoman who has concocted this history in her mind to justify her actions? And things get even weirder when the queen makes a move on her own son and the two kiss. This is a woman who had to endure God knows what and will do whatever it takes to survive in this unforgiving place and time. She's also incredibly unhinged, so while I found this totally gross, I didn't think it was that unbelievable. All of this is a betrayal for Amleth, but as he tells Olga, he will not kill a woman, let alone his own mother. With his true identity revealed, he must hide in the surrounding hills, and it's only when Fjolnir is about to kill Olga for not giving up information about Amleth that he comes back and risks his own life to save her. This is the first time that Amleth does something for someone other than himself. You may have noticed that the fight scene in which he takes on the king's men takes place with an entirely sheathed sword. That's because it's daylight and the blade will not come out in sunlight. Kind of like me in high school during a World of Warcraft raid. Amleth is captured, but his Confinement and torture is short-lived, as ravens peck away at his bonds, allowing him to escape. It's a real example of Deus Ex Machina, or should I say Odin Ex Machina, where an outside force is manipulating the plot. It's Olga who actually comes back for him, and knocked out from his torture, Amleth believes he's being ridden away on horseback by a Valkyrie to the gates of Valhalla. Now this could just be me, I did this while taking notes in a dark movie theater, but during the early fort raid scene, there's one shot where you can see a blonde hair woman on horseback with a red cape, who kind of looks like this Valkyrie in the background. She even says she wants, quote, the strong ones, since Valkyries only allow strong warriors into Valhalla. Am I completely crazy, or did any of you see this? as well. Amleth decides to forego his vow of vengeance and leave Iceland with Olga, but as they leave, he finds out Olga is pregnant with two children. His, of course. The fate he was told said from his ashes would spring a maiden king and that he would have to choose between kindness for his kin and hatred for his enemies. If he left Iceland, he would be turning away from this fate the gods had thread for him. So he jumps ship and leaves Olga. He believes this to be both a kindness to her and his children, knowing she would have gone with him and likely died in the process, and a hatred for his enemies since he'll wind up avenging his father. Amleth causes chaos at the king's camp by lighting everything on fire and freeing the slaves, and in a twisted set of events, he's forced to kill his mother and half-brother after they surprise attack him. Fjolnir comes across Amleth in front of the bodies of the queen and prince, and instead of fighting him right then and there, agrees to battle at the gates of hell. That mountain we saw at the beginning of the film, which has started to erupt. This also allows Fjolnir to prepare a crude Viking burial for his wife and child, where a horse is buried alongside the dead to carry them to Valhalla. 
As fate predicted, Amleth fights his uncle beside a fiery lake of lava along the mountain's edge. You can even hear Amleth chanting before the battle that he will cut the thread of fate. By him killing his uncle, he will be free of it. The fight culminates in Fjolnir decapitated and Amleth receiving a sword through the chest. Amleth has achieved his revenge, but in so doing has brought upon his own death, just like fate predicted. As he dies, he sees visions of Olga holding their two children, knowing they are safe safe and his bloodline intact. With his final breath we can see a glint in his eyes, the reflection of him being led into the gates of Valhalla by the Valkyrie. He has fulfilled his fate and avenged his father, even though he died doing so. Just like Hamlet is a tragedy, so too is the Northman. It shows how one man's lust for revenge results in the countless pain and deaths of others. But on the other hand, you get Anya Taylor-Joy as your lover, so it all evens out. Thanks for watching everyone, be sure to like and subscribe and for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... And I am his magic!